And right now, George Chevallo joins me live in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Hello, Joanna. Gian. Gian, right? Gian. Yeah. But you said Joanna. Almost. I, I, That's I was, a new one. I must think about my wife. That's her name. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like Joanne, actually. But <laughs> uh, what an honor it is to have you here. Uh, thank you. Thanks. You had a you had a uh, a smile on your face as you were listening to that clip back there, uh, in the introductions of you and Ali. <laughs> yeah. What were you thinking as you heard well, that? Well, I, I just thought of uh, how he went overboard in a way, in a nice way. I'm talking about the uh, the announcer. I got a kick out of the announcer. I mean, you know, the Canadian hard rock, blah blah blah, all that stuff. It was kind of cute, you know. Uh, and then, and then the cheers of yeah, uh, yeah. Of, of of support for you. Yeah, yeah, it was good, nice. You know, hearing that introduction to your famous fight with Ali, it does take one back to a, another time. Tell me what it's been like looking back over your career with this memoir. Well, uh, to me, uh, when I first started thinking about writing a book, I thought it'd be nice for my my future grandchildren well, and my present grandchildren one day to read about the grandpa you know it'd be just kind of be kind of neat and so i said hey i'm getting a little older I, who knows how much longer i'll be around i don't know i'm 76 now i just finished the book a little while ago so i said i, I did it just in time <laughs> maybe you know so i just wanted to have something set aside so something that my future generations could uh, read and uh, and present generations could read so uh, to me, it was important to get it out before something bad happens to me. I wanted to do it right now when I'm still alive, when I can still remember things and when my memory is still okay. And I have to talk about a whole lot of things that happened a, whole, a long time ago. So I had to make sure that I was still kind of had that mental acuity to remember things and figure things out how, all, how they all worked. It's amazing. It's an amazing chronology of, of your career and your personal life, uh, the, the whole life, the, the, the big victories and, and some of the desperately difficult times in your yeah. life. Uh, was it um, difficult to write or, or did it, was it somehow liberating or cathartic to write? I think it was a little bit of both, a little bit of both. I mean, it's hard writing, it's hard writing about the... Uh, certain things that I had a difficult time writing about my son Jesse who was my first son to die and he got he got in trouble a couple few times uh, with the police when he was very very young when he was 12 years old and uh, he had a rough time and uh, because he stabbed somebody with provocation it was which was eventually proved but initially he was found guilty of stabbing uh, a person like a big heavy guy 210 pounds 27 years old he was 12 at the time mm -hmm. and he was trying to break up a fight with my son and another kid he grabbed my son because he was on top of the other kid and started choking him and yelling out uh i'm making a citizen's arrest call the police and and my son kept you know, telling him, you're choking me, I can't breathe. And then they told him, I can't breathe, I'm going to stick you if you, don't, if you don't let go. But he refused to let go, and after repeated pleas, my son took out a little pen knife and stuck it into him. He was two, the other guy was 270 pounds, 5 foot 10, 27 right. years old. So anyway, make a long story short, my son was convicted, even though there were eight witnesses, seven young girls, and one adult male, and they all said the same story, that after repeated pleas, the guy still was choking my son. Anyway, the the, the uh, judge said that he was stabbed without provocation, he went to jail, sentenced five years at 12 years old, and uh, sentenced to five years, in, excuse me, he was 12 when it happened, 13 when, it was, when the verdict came down, and, when, and we had to go to court, and he sent away for five years till he was 18. Anyway, I, I was quite livid because of what happened. Uh, I don't know the judge had looked at it fairly. Anyway, to make a long story short, I got, I got the other guy convicted in an adult court of assaulting my son, and then he was let out of jail after a year and a half. So uh, it, was, it was difficult writing about that because, you know, because I was writing at it, I was, I was still mad at the judge, you mm -hmm. know, I was still upset. And it was, but anyway... I got through it all, and I was glad I did the book, and uh, I think it's been well-received, so it makes me feel pretty good. It's been very well-received. There, there's been a lot of tragedy in your life. It's interesting that you went back to that. That's not even Jesse taking his life yet, but that, that one moment where he's I, convicted, that feels I, like that's at the precipice of where things went wrong? Well, uh, I think, um, of course, uh, if my son didn't get involved in a motorcycle accident, I don't think all this insanity would have happened. I don't think all this craziness would have happened if if uh, he didn't get involved in a motorcycle accident. He got a motor, involved in a motorcycle accident and had the kneecap torn off. They reattached the kneecap to the knee at the hospital by taking a muscle area from his left thigh. Anyway, 
they uh, they put him on a heavy narcotic called Demerol for seven days, and they took him off it. And they put him on Tylenol 3, but Tylenol 3 wasn't taking care of the pain. So my son went to a party one night, complained about the pain in his leg, and in particular someone said he had something for my son's pain, and that was his introduction to heroin. And that was in May of 1984, and by the time September of 1984 rolled around, before I found out I had one addict in my family, I had three of them. Yeah. So then after that, it was just uh, my whole life... My family's whole life went in, in, in all kinds of crazy directions. George, you in the book you call that post-boxing life, right. your life after boxing. Right. Let, let me ask you a bit about the boxing life first, yeah, and sure. then come back to the those difficult stories. Uh, you, uh, first of all, you were at the peak of your career in the late '60s and '70s. It was a time when boxing was an enormous cultural force, much more so than today. Why do you think it was so huge back then? Well, first of all, uh, when I when I was fighting. Uh, for a good part of the time, for about a 20-year period from 44 to 64, uh, you could see fights on television for, uh, for no cost at all. All you had to do was have a TV set, and you can see the Friday night fights. You can see the Wednesday night fights. You can see the Saturday night fights. The Wednesday night fights, sponsored by Pasper Ribbon. The Friday night fights, sponsored by Gillette Cavalcade Sports, Gillette Blue Blades, and on Saturdays, Schaefer Beer. So uh, it was a... Uh, it was a, it was a more accessible easy, like, sport. More, far more accessible, and the people were all fight fans. Everybody seemed to be tuned in to who was champion, who was the contender, who was the new guy rise, uh, on the rise. So you're a kid. You grew up in the Junction neighborhood of Toronto. Right. You, you have your first real fight, quote-unquote, when you're just 10 years old. Right. What was it about boxing that you drew you in? Well, first of all, uh, my first uh, thought of ever wanting to be a fighter was when I was about 7 years old. I walked into a place called Morgan Cigar Store, which is like a convenience store. I looked at the magazine rack, and I saw a magazine called uh, The Ring. It called itself The Bible of Boxing, as it does today. And uh, I opened the pages up, and I see all these guys with muscles punching each other. I said, oh, man, this is for me. So I ran home. Oh, Mama, give me a set of boxing gloves. She started to laugh at you know, so I, I mean, I'm seven years old. I told her I want to be a fighter. Anyway, I kept bugging her for a couple of years. I kept uh, pestering her to get me a set of gloves. She finally got me a set of gloves. I was about nine, or maybe I think going on ten. Anyway, uh, I had a big set of gloves, like uh, four gloves, wine-colored. I remember in a kind of a beige bag, big beige bag. Mm. And I would take the gloves diagonally across the street, up a laneway to the unpaved parking lot of Lancia Macaroni Plant. And we used to call the unpaved parking lot the Macaroni Field. So I would go to the Macaroni Field, and I'd spar with my buddies. And I had one little advantage over most of them, because I used to read the sporting cards and in uh, Wheaties Breakfast of Champions uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cereal. So I would uh, read the, uh, uh, the, the sporting cards. Sometimes it'd be, uh, it would have baseball, football, hockey, whatever in it. But I used to read the ones on boxing. And uh, that gave you tips. an advantage? Yeah. Well, Joe Lewis used to say, you throw a jab to the body. Next time you faint the jab to the body, you make the guy's <laughs> hand right. go down, then you throw a hook to the head. So right. fainting guys out of position. So I did that fairly well. So one day an older guy, when I say older, maybe he's about 18 or 19, and he said to me, as a 10-year-old, George, you're pretty good with your dukes. Why don't you go to a gym? I said, where's there a gym? He said, at St. Mary's Polish Roman Catholic Church, about a mile away. So I go to the church, and uh, I start training there. It was a little gym in the, in the basement. They used to have dancers there on the weekends. And, uh, and they had training there every day of the week from Monday to Friday. And on the weekends would be, uh, it'd be on during the day. And uh, anyway, uh, the new priest came in. He says, Catholics don't dance, so no more dancing on the weekends, and the Catholics don't fight, so no more gym, no more boxing. So uh, his name was Father Podersky. I, did, I never did like him too much. You remember much. his I, name. I, yeah. I remember his name. <laughs> anyway, he, uh, anyway, because of that, I went, I went to another gym. I went to the gym over. But you've also said, George, in your book you say that you consider boxing the purest and truest form of athletic competition. I think so, because I always say in the book I talk about a, a caveman. If a caveman saw tennis or hockey or football or, or golf, he wouldn't know what the heck is going on. But if he saw two guys fighting, throwing punches at each other, he, he didn't understand that. That, you know, that, made, that would make sense to him. You can also get injured and hurt doing that. You, you suffered a lot of injuries over the years. Early on, you suffered a, a punctured eardrum. Uh, Joe Frazier broke the bone around your eye. How did you find... The courage to stick with boxing when you were going through stuff like that. Oh, I don't think it took courage. I mean, I just, I, I just enjoyed fighting so much. I never even thought much about that. I never thought much. I was, I was never concerned about uh, having a punctured eardrum. 
I just, well, I shouldn't say I was never concerned. I was concerned about the one fight ha I had after I got it uh, ha happened to me in training. But after that, it didn't bother, I didn't even thought about it. And you just, just like my eye with Joe Fraser. I had a puncture. Uh, my eyeball was uh, projecting past my uh, eye socket when I got hit with a left hook and it, and it broke the optic floor. Then they uh, they took my eye out, they put a piece of plastic silicone in my in my eye socket, and re put the eye back in, and I was good to go as far as I was concerned. So when and, stuff, and I, I never really thought okay. much about it, but anyway. well, when stuff like that happens, that as a boxer, <laughs> you don't you don't ever. There's no thought to maybe I should get out of this. Maybe this isn't. Maybe I'm going to get seriously injured. You just soldier back on. I, I didn't. I, I didn't even think about it. In one way, I mean, of course, the, the American Medical Medical Association tried to get me barred after my eye injury, but uh, I've, I've never had a problem that way uh, it, with my eye ever, ever since. I I was I'm conscious of it, and I th keep thinking of crazy things like when I die because it's, it's all hooked in with little tendons and ligaments or whatever. My eye is hooked in there. I think one day it'll all rot away and I'll be in my in a, in a coffin and all of a sudden it'll drop to the bottom of my skull and go clunk. <laughs> so one day it'll go clunk. So that's what I look forward to. <laughs> mm. we, 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 I mean, you chronicle for much of the book uh, many of the fights that you were in, many yeah. of the famous fights, yeah. and too, the, of course, the Ali fights mm -hmm. were at, the, at the pinnacle. Uh, when you think about the greatest moments, I mean, not in terms of measured in terms of success in the ring, et cetera, but just in, in terms of the way you feel, the way you felt, what was the greatest feeling you had about boxing in those years? Well, I could point out one fight which, which made me feel pretty good. I mean, in one way, uh, I was losing the fight, I think, uh, according to the... Uh, I thought I was winning the fight, but I looked so bad in the, in the fight with Jerry Corey. Uh, I had a, my eye was really um, sticking out past my eye, eyebrow, and I looked like a you know I looked like a one-eyed Marty Feldman if you know what I mean. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, I, when I come back from the sixth round, uh, waiting to come out for the seventh, the doctor came over to the corner and summoned the referee over. He says, "If his eye gets any worse, you're gonna have to stop the fight." I don't know. In retrospect, I don't know how much it could have gotten much worse. But anyway. The bell goes, I go out, and I know I had to knock him out that round, otherwise I was going to lose the fight. Anyway, I knocked Jerry out with one second to go in the round, so I got lucky that way, and I knocked him out, so it was a big win for me. But did you, uh, did you? I mean, it's a cliche to say, uh, I love being in the ring, but did yeah. you love being in the ring? I love the, the whole idea of, you know, uh, of... of of trying to beat somebody else as he's trying to beat me. And it was, uh, you know, to me, in a lot of ways, it's the purest form of sport that way, you know, mm -hmm. one man against another. And uh, one is never more dominant in any sport than other than, I mean, when you think about boxing, when you stand an over guy and count seven, eight, nine, ten, it, it doesn't get any much more dominant than that. So, that you know, there's a real thrill knocking somebody out. Sounds kind of crazy, you know, but uh, it's, a, it's a thrill to it. Uh, there's also a thrill when they lift your hand up and then when you win, the, you know, you won the fight. You know, or, and especially thrilling when you're behind in a fight, you come back to knock somebody out. How hard would you take it when you lost? Oh, that's like the end of the world temporarily. <laughs> you know, you, I never, especially if you thought you won the fight, then, 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 then that, 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 that's a bad situation. But most of the time, if you just lose, and you, if you get outpointed, if you get up, if you get the guy beat you fair and square, you know, I, I don't have any problem with that, but you, it doesn't make you feel very good, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. I'm speaking with uh, Canadian boxing great George Chevallo, part of our special series, Q in Sports, Legends, Rebels, Record Breakers. So, George, in your book, you write about the terrible personal losses you suffered after your pro boxing career ended. Uh, three of your sons developed drug problems. One committed suicide. Two died of over overdoses. Your wife, Lynn, uh, your first wife, also took her own life. I know you get asked a lot about how you've been able to carry on in the face of all that tragedy. Have you come closer to answering that question for yourself? Well, first of all, when I speak to young people in jail or in school or wherever I have the opportunity to speak to them and talk about what happened in my life with my family, uh, I have a chance to hopefully make young people th think the right way about drugs, be able to make the right choices concerning drugs. When I have a chance to do that, it makes me feel a little better. It makes me feel like my sons didn't die in vain, that my wife didn't die in vain, that somehow uh, because of what happened to them, they could help other people make the right choices in life at the most important time in your life, and that's as a young person. So when I, so when I do that, it makes me feel better about myself. It gives me... Uh, I guess a sense of self-worth, you know, elevates my sense of self-worth, I think, 
you know, and uh, when I do that, I feel better. I just like I say to myself, Jesse, Georgie Lee, Stephen, you know, you're helping other people, and my wife Lynn, you're helping other people. So, so that part is good. That's that's what helps me go along. In in uh, the mid '90s, after the loss of uh, of one of your sons and your your first wife, um, McLean's magazine interviewed you about a week after uh, you lost both of them, mm-hmm. and you say in that interview. Uh, um, where do I go from here? Where does one go when they're dead? You felt dead inside. How uh, do you have any sense of how you picked yourself up and carried on after that? Well, what helps me, what has, has helped me survive, and what continues to help me survive, is love of my family, love of my friends, people who cared about me, so who cared about the way I felt, cared about my situation and, and I have a lot of good friends I have a lot of good friends and uh, and my son uh, and my grandson rather Jesse uh, who loves me dearly you know, and whom I love dearly could never hang the phone up or never could say goodbye to me in person without telling me he loves me mm-hmm. I love you grandpa I love you too Jesse you know so when you tell somebody you love them and usually re- evoke a response from them they love you too you know so I, I hear that a lot in my life so that's what kept, that's what keeps me kind of bubbling up you know it makes me feel good about being alive still makes me feel good about being alive so and to me one of my favorite people of all time is my grandson Jesse he's so important to me and uh, I know I'm important to him so that makes me feel pretty doggone good you write that your your first wife Lynn struggled with alcohol. Right. Uh, you also describe. I mean, there's some tough times. She she hit you with a glass pitcher, a frying pan, even an oar. There was a, also a time when you hit back. I mean, behind all your success, it seems like there was also a lot of anger and pain in the Chevalo home. Where did that come from, George? Well, uh, I uh, you'd have to ask my wife, but she's not around. I don't know. I didn't I didn't have any anger towards her generally, you know. But she. She wasn't happy some of the time, some of the some parts of her life. Just like I'm not happy in every part of my life, of course. But I mean, what I'm saying is, uh, she she struggled with alcoholism, and uh, she got she took it out on, on my son George Lee. I got to talk about that in the in the book. When she kicked him out of the house, I said, "You're kicking him out of the house because he's drinking too much." I said, "You drink too much too. You should go to AA together." You know, I try to be civil with her. I said, "You got you should go together." Mm-hmm. Well, she she got upset with that, and uh, the next day when I actually she kicked him out of the house. And I brought him back in the house, and then uh, she made a nice lunch the next day. And she, said, come on, you know, this lunch is ready. And I walk in from the, from the, uh, from the kitchen into the dining room. I look up, I see an oar in full flight, he- heading towards my unprotected skull. Boof! I got whacked, and I felt uh, st- r- twin riblets of blood seeping into my eye sockets. And I remember thinking, I feel like. Uh, uh, Paul Newman and the cool, cool Hand Luke, you know, when he's playing Cool Hand Luke in the movie, and uh, I restrained myself. I felt like I felt like striking her, but I wouldn't do that. And then I wouldn't do that. So anyway, uh, she hit me over the head with the with the uh, with the oar. Anyway, uh, that was it. I said, so we can't live together. Like we can't do that. You know, you can't do that to me that way. You know, I'm bringing my son back in and getting, trying to get him help. And uh, you should be getting help yourself too. And, but, but she refused to get help. And the next day, I gave her fourteen thousand dollars to to go and get a, an apartment. Uh, and I paid her the upfront for a year or so. And then she did and, uh, come back. Eventually, she did come back. Yeah. You, uh, George, there are times though where you, especially early on, where you almost not only do you not provide the help, but you're 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 unclear about even what's happening in terms of your sons. You, you talked earlier about uh, Jesse starting to have problems with the law early on at 12 years right, old. But yeah. but you write that there was a period after, as you say, he got introduced to heroin, where Jesse, Stevie, and Georgie Lee, all three of your sons yeah. who would end up dying, yeah. were shooting heroin in your basement, right. but you had no idea. I had no clue. I never saw it. How, how how do you feel about that era? How do you how do you reconcile that 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 was happening and you didn't know? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I I didn't find out. I'm trying to remember uh, how I did find out. Of course, uh, when the when the uh, when Jesse uh, tried to uh, hang himself, 
try to hang himself one time. I don't know if that, I'm pretty sure that's in the book. I, I remember when my wife and I were separated, uh, and I went and I saw a light coming out of the garage on the side door through a window. And this was around 11, 11.30, 12 o'clock at night. And so I go over to open the door, and I see my son standing on a chair throwing a noose over a beam. And I said, Jesse, what are you doing? He said, but he was upset because he thought because his mother had left, that it was his fault, but it wasn't his fault. You know, she left because I, we had an argument over Georgie Lee about his drinking, and I told her that she should be going to AA with him right. together. So anyway, uh, that's how, that's when I first recognized that I might have a problem with him. You know, he was very sensitive. He was a very sensitive kid, and uh, he eventually did take his life. He shot himself. When they were all doing heroin? And you didn't know at first? Do you think you were in denial? No, I wasn't in denial. I, uh, I, I can't even remember right now how I found out. I can't even remember how I first found out. But when I, when I, when I did find out, uh, there were but three of them were using all, you know, all at the same time. I started off with Jesse, then George Lee and Stephen. And, and uh, when I did find out, it was only after the three of them were using it. So it was like a like a shock to me. I was saying to myself, how could I, how could I have missed all this for so long? How could, I don't know how I could have missed it, but I did. I mean, you got to remember, I was still fighting. I was in and town, out of town, and I had things happening all over the place. So I, I couldn't. Sometimes I was, you know, uh, you, you can see, but you're still blind, you know. And that's mm-hmm. what happened to me. I got to say too. I mean, you 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 had three sons who were so troubled, but you also have another son and a daughter who've grown up to, and are living very successful lives. How do you think they avoided the problems that Jesse, Stevie, and Georgie Lee had? Well, first of all, uh, they were kind of like a separate entity in a way. Like Mitchell uh, uh, did well in school, he did well in sports, he got a scholarship to play football down in Florida, and all that kind of stuff. Is he? I mean, he, his, his life's fairly. Uh, it was fairly predictable that he's going to be okay, and my daughter's much the same. Both the university graduates, and uh, she's so she's doing well in the food business. Um, the other guys kind of uh, clicked together. They're closer. They're all cl- very close in age, yeah. and uh, and when Jesse started using, he got his brothers using. So they were he were. They were they were they used to hang around more. That if there's anybody who hung around with each other the most, it was uh, it was uh, with each other. It was those three: number two son, number three son, number four son. They all hung close together. They were like a they were like a little group themselves. And Mitchell was separate from that, and so was my daughter by virtue of being a girl, you know. So, but you know, so they when when they got in trouble. When one got in trouble, the three of them got in trouble. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't long after. Jesse was using the all three. Since <laughs> since their deaths and the death of your wife, you've dedicated yourself to anti-drug activism. Are, George, are there lessons you've learned through that work that you wish you'd known earlier? In other words, what what advice do you have for people who are worried about a loved one's drug use? Well, first of all, uh, I talk about love in the family. and I, It isn't like my family didn't have love, but I know one thing. I, know, I recognize one thing. One of the Ten Commandments is honor thy father and thy mother, right? So when you're respectful to your mother and your father, you know, you, you, you be more, more likely to be respectful to your own self. Uh, and I'm not saying that my kids weren't respectful. They were, but they kind of, you know, I talk about uh, smoking. I talk about drinking. I talk about how that can, that can lead to drug use. I, think I, I talk about the simple act of smoking. Sometimes people say to me, why are you talking about smoking? I'm just saying, well, when you smoke a cigarette, today you disrespect yourself. And why? Because on a cigarette package, there's all the things that cigarettes can do to you. Cigarettes can be in, uh, right from Health Canada. Smoking tobacco can cause cancer. Smoking tobacco can cause heart attacks, strokes, emphysema, lung disease. Smoking tobacco can kill you. It's right on a cigarette package. And so when you smoke that cigarette, you know, if you look at that package and it tells you it's, it's going to do you harm, you, uh, I mean, you know, you, you, really, you are disrespecting yourself. Nobody's arguing with them. They're nobody's saying the cigarettes are good for you. The only uh, uh, stuff they talk about in cigarettes uh, with, with respect to your health is that it can harm you. It, can, it doesn't necessarily kill you, but it does kill a lot of people. Do you think that cigarettes necessarily lead to heroin, though? Oh, no, here's what I'm saying. So out of that disrespect for yourself initially, and if you go to a party one night when you're younger— 
uh, I always say it th- at school, out of schools or, or in jail when I talk to kids, I say, you know, 10 young people in your age, five smoke, five don't. You go to a party one night, which group of five is more apt to try the alcohol if it's introduced at a party? The group of five that smokes or the group of five that doesn't smoke? I always say, I got news for you, it's written in stone. So group of five already disrespects themselves. The group of five that smokes it, more apt to. It just And I think we all, and the next step, if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you drink alcohol, you get a, you get a little buzz, and somebody has to do a joint at the party, the audience is trying to join if you already smoked. Uh, if you already uh, smoked uh, cigarettes, easy to make that jump to smoke uh, weed. You know, so that's just the way it is. Next thing you know, prescription pills. Next thing you know, crack, coke, or heroin. That's No one starts off by doing crack, coke, or heroin. They usually start off with a simple cigarette. It's kind of like... It's kind of like this, what we know about smoking. If you saw two girls identically dressed, identical looking, two twin girls, then they're 12, 14, 15, well, however old they are, they're at a bus stop. In your natural mind, if, if the thought passed through you and you asked yourself, which of those two girls does better in school, the smoker or the non-smoker? In your natural mind, you'd say the one that does the best in school is the one not smoking. You know, in your natural mind. If you ask yourself, which one of those two girls was in trouble with the law, the smoker, the non-smoker, in your natural mind, you would say, it's the smoker that has trouble. If you were making a massive generalization. Well, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. you would. would. That's what you would think in your natural mind. So, in other words, in your natural mind is a thought that you would have. So somebody asks you after making that that uh, evaluation, they say, you say, oh, you saw the girl smoking, and she's, and she's in uh, uh, trouble. Uh, which one was troubled? You, you, would ask, you would say the one who smokes. And you would say, yeah, I, I feel that because that's what you feel. You just know in the back of your mind, if there's someone being disrespectful to themselves, it's got to be the smoker, not the non-smoker. When you're a non-smoker, it means you care about your health. When you're a non-smoker, it means that you, for whatever reason, you, you straight-arm smoking, because of concern for your health, it's got to pass through your mind. Right, no, you. Nobody says have a cigarette, it doesn't won't bother you. I mean, it does bother you, and but, there, there are problems when you smoke cigarettes. And I certainly don't mean this disrespectfully, but if have you learned through your anti-drug activism and the talks you've done, you've probably spoken to all kinds of folks, I know right across the country, around the world. Uh, yeah. uh, ha- have you learned something about how you would have what you would have said, how you might have dealt differently with, with Jesse or with Stevie? Well, first of all, Jesse got involved with drugs because of pain. Now, I'm not excusing him, but I'm just saying it was for a different reason than George Lee and Stephen. George Lee and Stephen uh, weren't in pain. They weren't in any physical pain. They weren't in any emotional pain. But my son was, my, my first, youngest son was. And however he, uh, he got them to do, do it, uh, they, uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's his fault. They may, they may have seen them do it, and they said, let, let me try that too. What I mean, would you say know. to them now, to Stevie and George Lee? Well, first of all, I wouldn't have to explain to them they've all, they're already they already died. So if I were to say, you know, I mean, things that have already happened to them, they know they knew as they were going along. They knew when they were messed up that they was never used it. My son Stephen told me, he says, "I'm so messed up." I said, I, I, "I can't tell you how badly I messed up I am." He robbed three drugstores in 45 minutes one time on the subway line. Go on the subway, rob a drugstore. Go back on the subway. Go back and get off another stop, another sub, another drugstore, and. Uh, and uh, then they go to rob another drugstore back in the subway, and he'd pass out in the subway, and the cops would see him, and they'd be called, and then they'd pick him up in the subway and take him into jail, go to court, and get sentenced, and go to jail. And it was just it's, it's crazy. It's just insane. He would, he would, Stephen would uh, pass out uh, in, a, in a police station, collapse, mm-hmm. boom, coma, boom, take him to the hospital. Uh, he, I, I remember one time I looked for Stephen in Guelph. I had him staying with his brother for a while. I, his brother, I said, you got to take care of Mitchell because I gotta, uh, I, I'm trying to get him into a rehab, trying to get your brother into a rehab, and I'm, I can't be running around with him and trying to keep him away from drugs and if I and to work on to getting him uh, a rehab. So please take care of him for a week or two till you know I can get him in. So. I do that, and a few days later, I go down to Guelph to see if I can talk to Stevie. I ask Mitchell where he is. He's not here. So I go looking for him, and I found him uh, close to midnight in front of a, uh, a veterinarian hospital. And I saw him with a, with a 
pipe in his hand. He's, and he told me he's trying to break in to get tranquilizer drugs and wow. uses to sedate wild dogs, cats, and raccoons. And when I saw that, I started crying. It was hot tears streaking down my cheeks. My poor son, my poor son, so out of control. It's awful to see. It's awful. George, all this loss you've suffered, I mean, looking back, do you, do you ever find yourself wondering why all this tragedy has been visited on you? Do, do you sometimes feel like your life has been cruel and unfair? Well, it's cruel and unfair. I mean, uh, what happens, I guess, I mean, I, I mean, but insinuating that, who, that uh, something's at fault, I mean, with God or something, I don't go around saying, well, God, uh, why, why'd you do this to me? It's not God's fault. It's just one of those things that, that happened, a crazy set of circumstances. Uh, you know, I, if my son didn't uh, have that problem with the, his leg, it might, maybe all of this craziness wouldn't have happened. Maybe. Maybe it's still How would, do you it? not get angry at God or angry at how this all happened to you? Around you, I don't. That's a good question. You know, I mean, am I, am I terribly religious? I'm not really, but you know, I, I think there's a creator. I think there's some some reason why we're all here, and but I mean, I don't know. You know, the, the whole truth. I don't claim to know. The, I'm talking to myself. I don't claim to know anything about that. I just think I think there's a creator. I think there's a sense of right uh, righteousness. I think you know. Uh, Good overcomes bad. Good's better than bad. You know, we're all we should be here to be faithful to each other. We should all be uh, uh, good people as well as we can be. Don't hurt anybody. Don't steal from anybody. Be just be kind to everybody as best you can. So, so that's the way we're supposed to be. Be good to your neighbors, like it says in the Bible. You know, so you, can be, be, you know, so try to be a good person. That's yeah, but it. people would understand if you were angry. Well, I, I've been angry. I've been angry at a psychiatrist's report of, about my sons and myself. I've been angry about things like that. But I mean, in terms of the overall picture, I don't know. I don't. I don't feel anger anymore. I just. I. I I'm. I'm. I feel. Uh, I, I feel. Re I feel upset. I feel uh, hurt. I feel all, all those things. I feel all those things. I feel. I love to see my sons. I miss my sons dearly. We had, we used to have a lot of fun. I have a guy, and when you think about all these things that happened to me, somebody might think I was a lousy parent. He said to me, my friend Stevie Grayley says, George, you're the best father I've ever seen, best I've ever seen. That's what he tells me. Because mm. I used to take my sons everywhere with me. I would take them to the gym and take them to, the, to boxing shows and uh, take them with my friends. And, and, when he, and my buddy Stevie thinks I'm a, I was aces as a father. But so, but does that does that mean... That I see myself as uh, uh, someone who who didn't make any mistakes. I sure I made mistakes. We all make mistakes. All all parents, even the so-called best of parents, but it can happen. In anyone's family, all these crazy things can happen. If you could you could see it happening in anybody's family, if a kid gets involved with dope because uh, of pain, and all this, you know, so, uh, what's one thing to get involved with dope when you say, like my son Georgeline Stephen, they got involved with dope and they weren't in pain, you know. They uh, they saw their brother using, and somehow they they started to use, and uh, you could fault them for that. But I couldn't fault Jesse so much because he was in pain. You know, something I can understand. If if life is three acts, and your first act was very very clearly boxing, your second act was dealing with a family and a lot of pain. What you're you're in your third act now. What what do you feel is the focus of your life now? Well, the focus of my life is. Uh, for the last 15 years or so, I've been speaking to young people about drugs, and that's that's what helps keep me going. I see that I've, I think I've uh, helped a lot of young people make right decisions. Hopefully, I've helped. I've had a lot of encouragement that way by people telling me that that I've helped their sons. That when they, or I speak, if I see a young man sometimes I talk, and he says, "George, you spoke in my school." Oh yeah, when was that? They'll tell me, "Oh, maybe 10 years ago." And, and what you said had a profound effect on me, and I want to thank you for it. So I get when I get that kind of rebound, when I get that kind of praise, that kind of kind of, kind of makes me feel a little better about myself, and gives me more incentive just to keep going that way, in that direction. It's a, it's, it's an honor to get to talk to you and have you here. Thank yeah. you for doing this, and oh. it's a very powerful book. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thanks, George.